If I could have everyone take their seats, please. I am, uh, I am delighted to welcome you to the 40th anniversary of Communication Studies at UCLA. The PowerPoint uh, you just watched in the lobby was created by one of our alumni, uh, Sandy Rand, and it gives a sense of what the world was like in 1974 when this department was founded. Um, before we begin our panel, I'd like to tell you a little bit about what Comm Studies is like today, for those of you who are visiting for the first time in a while. Um, first of all, I want to assure you that we continue to have some of the most outstanding faculty on uh, the UCLA campus, people doing field-leading research, and we continue to have among the very best teachers on this campus. Um, the fact that you're teaching a curriculum that is very similar to when you were here, with some notable changes. The curriculum now has two new fields to help address changes in the communication environment. Um, we now require a core requirement in new media to help address the changes of technology and communication that are, I think, evident every time you look at children or the internet. Um, don't do that. Okay. And political and legal communication, which is, uh, again, a very influential area in society. We have also decided to require our students to do what we call a practicum requirement. The practicum requirement has the students in the major um, be able to apply what they've learned in their theoretical classes in a uh, communication context where they are attempting to, say, persuade or affect people's thinking. An example of this is in my course on political communication. Students in the class are required to do uh, commercials for fictitious presidential campaigns between, uh, in the most recent case, between Senator Rand Paul of Kentucky and uh, Patty Murray of Washington. This is an example of one of the 30-second commercials my students did. Again, they did all the research. They were required to use certain footage I provided, and this is a resulting ad. I should warn you, by the way, if you have delicate sensibilities, some people are killed in this ad, literally. I'm actually not kidding. So there you go. The problem is, is as this war is drug on, they take that authorization of use of force to mean pretty much anything. I will not vote to send my son, your son, or anyone's daughter to war unless a compelling American interest is present. Make the wise decision here and avoid an unnecessary war. And just to even things up, here's a negative ad another group did about Rand Paul. This one is a little funnier. So. I will speak until I can no, no longer speak. And Paul lifted big sections of that speech about Gattaca right from the Wikipedia entry. Due to the frequent screenings, Vincent faces genetic discrimination and prejudice. The only way he can achieve his dream of being an astronaut is he has to become what's called a borrowed ladder. What does the fuck say? So I'm very proud of that ad <laughs> and, and the students in my courses and all the students in communication studies. We have the very best students on this, well, among the very best students on this campus. It is an exceptionally sought after major. We routinely turn away a thousand students a, a per year that want to get in the major. Um, we implemented a new admissions process this past year to help make those decisions as equitable and as well based as possible. Um, Students now have an incentive to take more challenging classes before the end of the major instead of padding their GPA, which I think is a perverse incentive we've had. Um, we now require the students to do a creative, uh, creative work in six different essays that we read before we admit them. And uh, we also allow students to uh, make their case in person in some cases uh, before an, a very distinguished panel of alumni and faculty, um, including some of the people in the audience today. Um, we tried this this last year and couldn't be happier with the results and plan to continue this in the future. Um, and speaking of the future and outstanding students, one of the things we're working on now with the help of Dean uh, Sandra Durante, who is right there modestly in the fourth row. You should be up here. This is the whole seat right there for you. Anyway, so uh, for a new PhD program in communication, this program will help increase our nationwide impact on the field of communication help steer the future of the discipline, and also help our students have better trained TAs for their classes and interact with the undergraduates. And we're very excited by that and think we'll be able to attract some outstanding students for that program, in part because of, again, the faculty that we have and the research that they're doing. Um, we have cutting edge research taking place in research labs that just blow my mind every time I see the research that's coming out of them. 
Um, those of you who graduated in the last decade have probably made a trip to the basement of Bunch, among other places, to see the advanced physiological measures and other things that we are able to do with our state-of-the-art research facility there that Greg uh, Bryant and Carrie Johnson run and Neil Malmuth. And we also have, frankly, one of the most outstanding mass media resources in the entire world here in our Communication Studies Archive. Um, the Communication Studies Archive was started by Paul Rosenthal, who is in the front row, is also one of the founders. <laughs> founders of Communication Studies here at UCLA, but also of the multiple, multiple choice exam that I can look on some people's faces and see you know, the excitement in some of you when I mention that term. Um, since 2006, uh, Francis Steen, who is sitting, where are you, Francis? Back there, has converted the collection of this uh, system to digital, and we now have about a quarter million different television programs in the collection, and more than a billion words of television news uh, indexed and searchable by our students. It's an amazing resource. We're currently mounting an effort to preserve the videotaped analog material that Paul recorded, again, since the Watergate hearings until 2006. It's a, another basically 200 plus thousand uh, programs that we would like to have digitally available and indexable by the students. Um, we have, uh, in the short term, also been uh, digitizing a subset of the collection, which is uh, speakers on campus in the 1960s and 70s recorded by communication studies in the prior speech department. Um, we've put these things up on YouTube, and they've been very popular on the website. Um, we have over 250 speeches and other videos up there now. And uh, in fact, uh, Derek Boland, who's taking photos in the lobby, has been uh, putting the material up. And we've had, I think, last time I looked, 200,000 minutes of viewing. So I, I don't want to convert that to hours. It's less impressive. But uh, it still is, I think, something we can uh, be pleased with. And you know, speaking of alumni contributions, this was funded by alumni contributions, as is a new program that we have called Partnership UCLA. Um, we've created Partnership UCLA to help us engage with our alumni and uh, with members of the community and help our students in their professional development. Thanks to a very generous gift from Richard Ross, who is a friend of our department. Um, in July 2013, we launched our involvement in Partnership UCLA. In January, we had 25 uh, senior executives uh, from various communication industries interview and select the 2014 class of college fellows in communication. These students will benefit from alumni mentorships. Um, we'll also be able to have access to uh, summer internships in extremely competitive firms and competitive companies. And also, through this program, we've been able to directly support our educational mission by having hands-on training or other uh, guest lectures in our courses building on the expertise of our alumni, building on the, uh, the knowledge that those alumni have. Um, for example, in my political communication course last quarter, we had a series of experts and in, uh, alumni and uh, consult consultants for political campaigns come and speak to my students, which the students report to me they found very valuable. Um, moving forward, we hope to expand this program by uh, finding additional ways to engage alumni, um, having uh, more alumni be involved. If you're interested in becoming involved, you can find the link on our website, uh, which has recently been revised, under the alumni uh, tab of that page. Here's the website for those of you who haven't seen it recently. I'd also point out uh, in the upper right-hand corner, if you'd like to follow us on Facebook or LinkedIn, we have the links easily available there. Right above that is a bright gold button, gold button, uh, <laughs> if you'd like to get involved financially. Uh, I raised that gold button in part because this is the year of the UCLA Centennial Campaign. Um, you might be aware that UCLA started off as a branch campus of another university that shall became nameless, uh, <laughs> but has distinguished itself greatly over the years. Um, we have been delighted with UCLA's uh, impact on the world, and we think that this campaign is an opportunity to support the university and an opportunity for our alumni especially to become more involved with our campus. Um, this is a period where technological and social changes happen so quickly that the world changes in the blink of an eye. And we are uh, feeling that UCLA is a worthy partner if you want to create a lasting legacy in this ever-changing world. Um, 100 years of achieving the seemingly impossible and forging new ways forward are yours in, in building a better tomorrow for you, our students, and the world. And speaking of a lasting legacy, I wanted to again reference our gratitude towards Richard Ross. Um, he has just made a transformative gift uh, to the department. 
in the memory of his son, Tony Ross, um, designated the Tony Ross Endowed Undergraduate Journalism Internship Award. This endowment will encourage undergraduate students studying in the area of journalism and new media to participate in internship experiences by providing them for financial support um, for unpaid internships, which are still very common in those fields. Um, deserving communication studies students will be selected to receive the award in conjunction with the participation in an unpaid internship, including print, broadcast, and new media journalism. Richard is unable to be here tonight, but I've been told he'll be watching the, uh, the videocast live. So if you could please join me in a round of applause to thank Richard for his generosity. Thank you again. All right, so with that note, I would like to introduce some other generous alumni who have been uh, willing to spend some time on the phone with me and also here tonight on stage uh, discussing and sharing their knowledge uh, with a panel talking about communication in the next 40 years. Um, I'd like to start off by introducing Julia Lamb. Julia is actually one of my former students. Um, Julia is the co-founder and CEO of Enchanted Labs, which is an early travel stage startup. She also doubles as a co-founder of the A3 Foundation, which is a nonprofit supporting Asian American artists in the media, and serves as an advisor for innovation and entrepreneurship at UCLA. I should mention that Julia was actually the inspiration for what has become Startup UCLA on campus. Um, she guest lectured in my class, and then in our discussion afterwards, we say, why don't you do this? And we're like, why don't we do that? So it's, uh, it's actually been a tremendously successful program. We interviewed our third class today, and it's been a really helpful thing for the UCLA environment. Um, Julia, uh, prior to joining the startup 4A, Julia was an early Facebook employee. What was your employee number? Uh, it was about 200. 200 at Facebook, so early Facebook. Um, she was, uh, let me see. She worked with many high-impact developers, uh, marketing initiatives, including the Facebook Developer Garage Program, Facebook Presence, and the F8 uh, Developer Conference. She also worked for Facebook's $10 million Facebook Fund, or FB Fund, um, helping to choose and mentor over 50 startup teams, including uh, Wildfire, Zimride, which is now Lyft, and fuzzy mustaches, um, TaskRabbit, uh, Samsa Source, and Vitana. Uh, she holds her BA in communication. Uh, should I tell the year? No, we won't tell you. What? Okay. I'll point out, by the way, we were able, if you kind of fudge the math, to have one of our panelists from each of the four decades of communication studies. <laughs> one of the people is getting shorted a little bit, but I won't let you guess which one. So. Okay, next is Andrew Lincheski. Nailed it. Yeah, there we go. He was giving me trouble earlier. So um, he is the creator and co-executive producer of the new USA Network original series, Royal Pains, now available on Netflix. Yes. I, I've been looking. Thanks for the plug. Sure. <laughs> no, I'm plugging Netflix, technically. That's okay. <laughs> I'll take it. Okay. Um, by the way, I have to point out, this is like six-point type. I just the printer. <laughs> and I'm getting old. Okay, so if I stumble, I apologize. Um, okay, so Lincheski was the chief curator of the Lincheski Archives, one of Hollywood's biggest private collections of unsold scripts. Um, he survived years of profound unemployment with the <laughs> endless support of his loving family. He proudly graduated from the Communication Studies Department at UCLA. Lincheski will be made... Uh, will make his feature film debut in 2010. That's future tense. I I'd go with a larger font next time. Okay. <laughs> this, is all, this is all trouble. And again, this is a good time for me to be reading this. So, uh, matrimonial comedy, The Big Question, helmed by 30 Rock Emmy, uh, Emmy nominee Michael Engler. He's also writing, uh, has writing credits on the award-winning NBC show You See Undercover. Okay. And again, no year of graduation, but we'll just... Appreciate start. it. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> Ron Pitts is a former Green Bay Packers and Buffalo Bill defensive back and is a sports announcer, host, and producer. As a for Fox Sports NFL broadcaster, Ron has covered the Super Bowl. As a member of Pat Summerall and John Madden's legendary broadcast team, covered the NCAA Final Four, and served as a game analyst for college football and ABC Sports. He's also hosted Under the Helmet and Discoveries Destroyed in Seconds, which, God help me, I love that show. So anyway... So, uh, among others, Pitts graduated from UCLA in 1985 with a degree in communication and is married to communication studies alumna Babette Perry. Residual. Appreciate the year. I would love some residuals from that show. <laughs> <laughs> the, they were destroyed in seconds. Yeah. It's unfortunate. Okay. <laughs> Judy Johnson is the C is CMO of Caruso Affiliated. Caruso Affiliated is one of the largest privately held real estate companies in the U.S. You might be familiar with the Grove and some of their other properties. They're moving to Pacific Palisades, right? Yeah, the whole thing. Americana. All right. Um, so after 17 years with Golan Harris, leading a global full-service communications firm, 
More recently, she served as president of operations west of its Chicago headquarters, uh, managing staff, senior client accounts, business development, and operations for offices in Los Angeles, Orange County, and San Francisco. She also served on the company's global management team and helped lead a number of company-wide initiatives, including serving as G4 transformation team, which is in the forefront of the PR industry's evolution in integrated marketing. While at Golan Harris, uh, Johnson defined and managed award-winning 360-degree brand campaigns across paid, earned, owned, and shared channels. Some of her most prominent clients include Amazon, and so I included Amazon, Cold Stone Creamery, kind of line, Disney, Disneyland and Downtown Disney, Farmer John, Forest City Development, Las Vegas Sands Corporation, McDonald's, uh, Ritz Carlton, and Toyota, among others. Um, without further ado, I'd like to invite our panelists to the stage, and we'll begin the panel. I'm nervous around these chairs. <laughs> Oh, I've been told that anytime there's a lull, I'm supposed to say, what do you think, Judy? And I immediately <laughs> say, no, I defer to you. <laughs> That's right. Okay. Well, I wanted to start off by having the panelists tell us a little bit about your field, a little bit about how related to what you studied at UCLA. Would you like to start, Judy? Sure. Okay. Well, obviously, I was a communications major. That's why we're all here. Um, but back then, because I was, I guess I'm the oldest one here. Yeah, we don't have to stress that. Yeah, yeah. well, you know. So, uh, but definitely not the era of the 70s, so. Um, but there were really two tracks. One was interpersonal communication at that time, and the other was mass, and I opted to go for mass because I knew I wanted to either go into advertising, marketing, or public relations, um, which I ended up doing a little bit of all of those. Um, so the question was really like, what kind of helped me get where I'm going? I think that what I would say about UCLA um, as a place for education is that it teaches you to be an analytical thinker, teaches you to be a great writer, and just, I think, an overall general good communicator. And I think that as a, a mother now of two young children, I tell them all the time, in school I didn't necessarily learn that it's about really good interpersonal skills and, um, I mean, young school, uh, elementary school, and being able to have a conversation with people and to persuade people, whether that's with a debate with your spouse or whether it's uh, trying to get something in the workplace or sell a product or service. And so I do think that a lot of that I learned here, um, the major was and still is very theoretical, and so much of the practical application of what I do I had to learn on the job. But I do think the tenets of learning to be a problem solver, uh, deadline oriented, and um, an analytical thinker really began here. Okay, Ron? Uh, communications major, obviously. Uh, okay. 85, so I'm one year after you, Judy. Yeah. And, uh, you know, for me, I chose the road of mass communication, obviously uh, becoming a broadcaster and that whole deal. But uh, inter interpersonal communication was huge for me, especially understanding how people communicate, that model. And as Judy mentioned, it was very theoretical, but that theory did come into play for me especially things like understanding nonverbal communication with people. In my job, I have to interview a lot of players, a lot of coaches, a lot of people who don't necessarily want to talk. And you've got to find a way to get them to talk. And out of that, I think I understood that, number one, information is power. That's one of the first things I learned from uh, some of my core communication classes. Information is power, and you've got to have the information in order to get anything out of that conversation. So that helped me tremendously in my career, and it still helped me right now. I've kind of transitioned from the sports side, still doing some sports, but more into the uh, entertainment side of, of uh, media. And, and I think even more so there, because now it's like you got to know who just got popped for the DUI and who's sleeping with who, and <laughs> yada, yada, yada. So, <laughs> no matter how you spin it, the information being powerful is always a key. Um, I'm a TV writer producer, which is um, being a, an artist and a CEO at the same time. So there are a number of different ways in which you can burn yourself out and lose your mind very slowly. Um, <laughs> and I went into comm studies for one very simple reason, which is I got rejected by the film school. Um, oh. which, <laughs> at the time, I didn't feel so good about it, but in retrospect, it's the best thing that ever could have happened to me. And you know, they tell. Um, beginning artists, writers, directors, actors in my field that um, when they're just trying to break in, 
you don't hire an agency, you hire an agent. And people looking for legal counsel are told you, you don't hire a law firm, you hire a lawyer. And similarly, you know, what I took away from UCLA was not as much from the department as it was from the professors. So uh, Professor Rosenthal I took uh, legal communication with, and it taught me about the law from a communications perspective. And Professor Malmuth, I took um, pornography communication. Um, <laughs> I, I, class didn't quite live up to its billing, but uh, <laughs> it was, it was uh, illuminating nonetheless. And um, no, no one more so than, than Marty Gregory. Um, to me, she, she always has been the program, and uh, I can't imagine it without her. Um, the two classes that, that I remember most were um, Speech One, uh, Introduction to, Munic to Communication, which on, its, on the surface was about um, making uh, a case based on a particular hypothesis, but really it was about storytelling and connecting with an audience, which served me immeasurably as a writer. And uh, the other one was uh, COM 185, the um, internship class, which uh, really gave me a huge head start <coughs> in the marketplace. Um, Marty came in on the first day and said, uh, today I'm going to teach you guys how to answer a telephone. And uh, everybody rolled their eyes. Um, and <laughs> Unfortunately, a lot of us learned the hard way our first week in a new job how important it is to be able to answer a telephone correctly. Um, so, uh, so to this day, you know, the things I learned in those classes really helped shape uh, the career. The answer, ahoy hoy? Hoy hoy? <laughs> oh, how to answer the telephone? I'm sorry. Marty, how, how do you answer a telephone? I don't know. <laughs> So much for leading by example. I'll, I'll, I'll tell a quick story about that. So one of my fellow classmates, he went to work after we gradu graduated for a, a really big producer. And uh, he had no idea how to answer a telephone. So um, his first week on the job, uh, he answered the phone and he said, um, such and such is office. And the guy said, uh, hi, um, can, uh, can you tell her it's Bob calling? And he said, oh, I'm sorry, she's not in, but I'll have her call you back. So the boss came back in and he said, Bob called. And she said, Bob who? He said, I don't know, I figured you would know what Bob it was. <laughs> so she had a very tall stack of scripts on her desk, and she picked up the thickest one and started smacking him over the head with it. <laughs> so he goes back out to the desk, and about 20 minutes later, the phone rings again, and he answers and says, such and such is office. And the guy says, um, hi, can you tell her it's Dustin calling? And <laughs> my friend started to cringe. He's like, I can't believe I'm going to have to do this, but I'm sorry, Dustin who? <laughs> <laughs> And she heard from her office him saying Dustin Hill, so she came out with an even thicker script and started saying <laughs> <laughs> So, valuable lesson. Okay, so and Julia? Um, so I'm Julia and I'm uh, in technology. So uh, I guess I like to think of technology as using software and hardware to um, create more efficiency and more value. It's kind of like a really broad term, but I mean, of course, we're all familiar with technology from your Googles and your Facebooks and your LinkedIn, and I think we all use our mobile devices on day in, day out. Um, so Com Studies to me, I was also mass communications, yay. Um, and I, I worked for Facebook for four and a half years from when it was pretty small, about 200 people to about 2,500 people is when I ended up leaving. Um, and so, I mean, there are now over a billion users and they're worldwide, and so I think for, for me, um, Com Studies really helped me think through how different people um, receive different messages and how you can put different things like out there for them. Um, you know, I, again, like as we were getting more global users, I mean, it started as, you know, a Facebook, or, or sorry, Facebook was specifically for college campuses, right? So it started as a medium basically for college uh, students to communicate with each other. And as we grew, every time we'd grow, we'd have to kind of change the message. Um, and so, I mean, if you think of like really early Facebook times, it was pretty clown town is probably the best way to describe it. It was just a bunch of, um, you know, it was, it was a bunch of like 18 year olds that were yeah, going through their, um, their networks and finally for the first time being able to connect with the people around them. I mean, being able to see who was in this room and being able to know you know, like what kind of interests that they had. Um, so I think there is a lot of uh, just trying to understand the different uh, cultural needs. Um, I think also um, just uh, being in kind of uh, a, an environment where you're trying to build things so quickly, there's a lot of room for miscommunication. And so I think uh, Com Studies really helped me kind of understand how to persuade people in very different ways. Um, you, you use the foot in the door technique a lot, where you're like, hey, can I, can, how, can I get you to sign up for like this little thing? And then it's like, oh, could you help me with this other thing? Um, but I, I think that those were uh, two really helpful things that helped me out there. Okay. 
you've actually given a little bit of an idea of how Facebook changed while you were there? It was, it was the Facebook when you started there. It was the Facebook. Uh, I don't know if it was the Facebook when I started there. It was the Facebook when I signed up. I was a sophomore. I think I was a sophomore in college, and I was avoiding finals. And that's why I signed up for Facebook <laughs> originally. And uh, I joined uh, shortly after college. So it just kind of. Um, I, I, there was a class back in the day where I actually assigned students to sign up for the Facebook back in the day, but that wasn't one of the rooms. So. I was, I was. Actually, so uh, the two classes that helped me the most in my uh, career and kind of prepare were actually Tim Grohling's classes, which is probably why I'm here. I'm actually here to like tell you how great he is <laughs> as the chair of the department. Students, so yeah. um, but, yeah. <laughs> Bravo. <laughs> this is why I get invited back, right? Um, but one of the classes I took with him is called Computer Mediated Communications. And I don't know, can I see a show of hands of anyone who might have taken that? All right, so we got a few. And it was a very interactive class. And so at the time, we were studying things like you know, Blogger and Zynga and um, Usenet and looking at micropayments with like iTunes. Um, and I think what was so interesting and cool about that class was how connectable it was. You know, it was something that you were doing all the time in your own life and then you're doing it in class and you know looking at like I think one of the assignments was actually to look at how many cookies um, internet uh, providers put on your computer and it's a lot you guys should check that out <laughs> uh, but just kind of getting a feeling of how um, this uh, this industry was quickly developing so Andrew how has yeah. your industry changed since you started it? Um, <laughs> well how many people here went to the movies last weekend two weekends how many people here binge watched at least one episode of a TV show they love this weekend? So that's pretty much how the industry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, very nice. Okay, Ron. You know, when I first started broadcasting NFL games for Fox, it was '94, and they used to send us all of our information, our statistical information through the mail. So we'd get this packet, <laughs> and literally it was a box of stats. Okay, because that, it was either that way or they faxed it. And it, when your fax machine burned out, okay, then they had to go back to mailing it. <laughs> and I just remember about six years after that, all of a sudden someone said email. And it was amazing because I could get all of that in an email. And when that happened, everything changed. I could now take my computer on the plane. I didn't need my paper boy satchel to get on the plane and you know, it looked like I was going through a paper drive when I got off and there were papers everywhere and it just streamlined everything. The information was cleaner, it was faster, it changed how we did games. We were now more efficient, we could get the information faster. I think that's the key. The information download <clears throat> from wherever you want to call it, the cloud or whatever, it was now immediate. So when something happened in Chicago by the time I got on the plane in L.A., I knew about it, not once I got to Chicago. And that's three hours, and we know three hours in today's world, that's an eternity. Like we say, make, uh, make news, not history. And I think that's been the biggest change. Are you saying me. technology helped you? <laughs> <laughs> Slightly, yeah. Okay. And Judy, we've talked about this, but I'm, I'm sort of curious how you would describe the changes in your industry. Yeah, well, technology for sure. So we made an inside joke for the older two of us in the green room before coming out here that um, in our era, the big thing coming was Professor Cole talking about cable was coming. <laughs> so we were going to have more than just less than this many stations. Um, but really, technology has, as we all know, transformed everything. And as um, a head of an agency or now um, a CMO, really how people get information, how they live their lives, how they transact, how they share, what they trust. All of that has completely changed due to technology and many businesses have gone out of business because of technology. But if you look at the way we were all originally taught, it really was the brand had the control and they were able to communicate what they wanted through a very limited number of channels. And you could reach everybody, probably about 90% of the country, by being on three networks at the same time in the morning. And we all know with the splintering and proliferation of media, it's extraordinarily difficult to get a percentage of that with a lot of buy. And so, um, and then with time shifting with technology and mm -hmm. people getting it on demand when they want it, how they want it, on the device that they want it, um, the commercial isn't really relevant anymore. So how do you stand out and resonate as a company or a brand or an individual, depending upon who's being served, 
um, in a way that makes sense for today with how people get and share information and trust information has changed as well. So I would really say that is the biggest change. And so therefore, you look at most media outlets today um, from a print perspective, and many of them are in bankruptcy. Many of them that we were, are, were, were beloved are gone. Um, and when we talk, talk about where we will be in 40 years, I think we'll have another conversation about that. Yeah. Well, that's actually the next thing I was going to ask about is where you see the next big thing in your industry and where you see the industry going in 40 years from now. If you want to, as long as you're hot, keep yeah. rolling. Because well, you're looking at me. Okay. Um, yeah. What well, do you think, Judy? Yeah, well, thank you for asking. Um, I, I think a big part of it is data. You know, you, you carry a cell phone and you, um, everything you do is tracked. And Google has lots of information and so does Apple. And um, that information is moving to a broader group of um, folks who find that information interesting and probably at some point will be selling that information. Um, you know, you used to market to the masses and then it became very much narrow casting, but now it's all customized. I mean, there's no reason, you know, whether it's, you know, advertising on the internet, but really, you know, it's, it's custom messages. And uh, we all hear a lot about, you know, when I was in college, we all talked about 1984 or so Orwellian, but the reality is we are in 1984 and 2014 because we have that data and, um, um, it will be used in very different ways, I think, than it is today. Some of them powerful and some of them probably pretty negative. Yeah. I, I don't want to talk about the startups we saw today, but yeah. <laughs> so, anyway, Ron? Uh, remote access. That's another big thing. I keep going back to my, my broadcasting NFL games and things of that sort. But the broadcaster in a location, on location, will soon disappear. It's already happening. The broadcasters will be in a booth in LA, even though the game is being played in New York. 20 years ago, I remember saying to one of my directors, the, the late Sandy Grossman, who only had like six, seven, eight, nine Emmys, I said, you know, Sandy, I think one day we're not even going to go to the game. He said, no, 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 the technology, it's not there yet. Three years after that, he said, remember that idea you had about the broadcasters not even going to the game site? He said, that's here, and that will be the future that's one big thing I see coming at light speed. And when the, the, the networks figure it out financially, that they can save on that bottom line, then it's a done deal. It's like uh, The Daily Show with John Stewart's foreign correspondence. <laughs> <laughs> Pushing in that direction. Okay. So, so Andrew, other than binge watching and uh, you know, watching more things on Netflix, again, oil pains available on Netflix. I'm really liking you today, Tim. Okay. <laughs> I'll play the contrarian mainly because I like to be a pain in the ass. Um, I think nothing is changing. And if you're interested in, is, is this PG? You didn't give us that heads up. Okay. Um, he gave us permission to use a dirty word now and then. That's what he's asking. I was dipping my toe in the water. I thought ass was a nice way to kind of yeah. get my feet wet. Um, I think nothing is changing if you're interested in doing what I do for a living. It's still about great storytelling, it's about characters, it's about engaging people emotionally, and it's about holding their interest. I mean, people aren't talking about Netflix because it's a cool name or it's an interesting te technology or because they had those you know, nice little red envelopes. They're talking about it because they're putting out fantastic programming. Um, House of Cards is a great show, and that's why people are talking about Netflix. Amazon is the biggest retailer on the planet. They don't have the buzz as an original programmer that Netflix <coughs> has right now because they haven't found their breakout show yet. They will. It's just a matter of time. But um, I think you know that kind of speaks to where things are headed, which is um, content finally becoming king. And you know, people of the, the 18 to 34 generation don't turn on the TV and flip through two, three, four, five till they find their show. And they don't tune into NBC to see what's on NBC. They say, OK, what I want to watch is Blacklist. That's right. And that's their distributor, and that's their brand. And they go into iTunes, or they go into Netflix, and they say, let me watch the blacklist. Yeah. So I'm, I'm sort of, just to follow up, yeah. I'm curious. I mean, we mentioned the binge watching and such. Does it worry you that in the entertainment industry that you are competing not just against the best programming of today or your current competitors, but all of this back catalog of outstanding shows that, that people are getting exposed to or can watch in one setting? I mean, does that? Make you nervous? Don't I look nervous? Okay. That's why I want you to keep plugging the show. Okay. <laughs> there are a lot of options out there. Um, and, uh, and, you know, trying to break through the clutter is more challenging than it's ever been before. But um, the upside is if you do find something that breaks through, the, the rewards are really uh, promising. Um, I, it, you know, it, it's changed the, the nature of storytelling slightly in the sense that um, 
you know, the difference uh, between procedurals and serialized shows are that procedurals are the medical shows, the legal shows, um, the cop shows, where there's, you know, a story that's closed-ended that begins and ends within each episode every week. And that's been the bread and butter of, of TV since, you know, the, the, the dawn of its existence. And um, that's becoming a, a very, very troubled model because um, those shows become inherently repetitive and thus boring when you're watching them eight at a time. So that's why most of the shows you're seeing right now are these serialized shows with these long arc open-ended mythologies, you know, like Homeland and Masters of Sex. And, um, and so that, that, that's a way in which I think the storytelling actually has been shaped by the technology is you have to figure out a way to make sure that at the, end, at the end of your episode, you're giving people not just a satisfying conclusion to the story they've just, just watched for 43 minutes, but a very compelling reason to come back next week. So they've gotten rid of the reset button. Right, and yeah. I was just gonna add to that and something you, you mentioned, Judy. It, uh, nothing ever really goes away now. You can find it anywhere. Mm -hmm. And so if you've got something out there that you're really not proud of, you may see it again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, you For the next 40 years. Right, <laughs> right exactly. And, and, and I recall back to something that uh, uh, Professor Cole, Jeffrey Cole, said in, in, I believe it was Communications 101, an introductory communications class. He mentioned, if you have any amount of money that you're thinking about investing, if you get to that point, think about cable, television, satellite television. Mm -hmm. He said, there is going to be 1,000 channels. And I just kind of said, okay, how much time's left in class? <laughs> <laughs> and I'll be darned, it's, we've got 1,000 channels, kind of, Andrew, like you're saying, whether it's uh, Netflix, uh, on demand, whatever the deal is, we've got that kind of pervasive communication out there when it comes to television, movies, whatever your form of entertainment. Right, but I mean, also with just mobile devices, I mean, everyone has several mobile devices on them. I mean, the other day I had a laptop and a, uh, an iPad and then a, like a, my iPhone on top of it. And that was just like me going to work as in every day. Um, and I, I saw this uh, report today by Mary Meeker who does a lot of reports on like mobile devices. And she said that um, the, the mobile addicts, uh, I think access an application 150 times now per day. So that's like six that's right. or seven times an hour if you never slept. That's a lot, right? And, and I, I mean, that number has grown tremendously in the, the last year. I think it's more than doubled. So I mean, more and more people are being more connected with each other. I mean, things don't go away. My boyfriend has a device that takes pictures every 30 seconds. So as you can imagine, there are a lot of unflattering photos of me in this world now. <laughs> And this is just the way that things are going. I mean, you've got Google Glass. Um, I, I don't know if anyone's had a chance to check that out, but you know, you can take photos and videos everywhere. Um, so it's it's a very interesting world that we live in now, where you're not necessarily focused on um, like kind of curating your life in a certain way that you used to be able to. I think Judy was talking about this earlier, where you have to just be comfortable with yourself and that being out there everywhere, and people being able to access memories from 10 years ago. Um, and, you know, I mean, the children that are growing up today, they're going to be able to see their whole life documented. It's pretty interesting. Yeah. yeah. No, we've had the discussions in 151 and other classes about once something is on the Internet, it's on the Internet. It's on the Internet. It's Forever. on the Internet. Forever. <laughs> there, there Forever. Is no reason. Yeah, but I think, you know, one of the things about technology and certainly with mobile is that um, how you come into experience a brand. So, you know, as a brand marketer, you look at what is the brand experience, what is the brand essence, how it's articulated, how it looks, how you speak about it, and then brand protection. And on the, on the brand, you know, uh, feel, if you are a company, take any company, Nestle, okay, that experience would be the products, that would be how it advertises, that would be, you know, um, if you called somebody at a call center, it would be all possible touch points. And, you know, if you walk into a mall today, for example, and you get the mobile app and, you, they, and it's not, you know, they don't have one, you can't figure out where the directory is, and you go to a website and it's not mobile optimized, you get angry. And maybe some of the older folks in the room don't, but young people today, because you may not even know what I'm talking about. Really angry. But they get really I'm angry. angry. Right now. And so a brand has to be every digital touch point as good as the brick and mortar touch point, as well as the hard, you know, packaged touch point, because people get really frustrated if they can't get everything they want when they want it in the way that they want it at right. that particular moment. So, so it's crazy. Yeah. I think the thing that's the most interesting about technology and how that's changing is actually how everything is so instant, right? Uh, I mean, you look at your teenagers right now and they have like instant communication, right? You, you text people. I mean, I text my mom, you know, they text you back. It's just like this 
it, this world where you don't have to wait, you don't have patience anymore. Um, my cousin has like a four-year-old and they watch uh, It's a Small World on YouTube, like on an iPad, and then they went to Disney World and they were like, why, why can't I just go again? And they're like, you have to stand in line. They're like, I don't understand. Can I just push play again? And mm -hmm. it's like it's like this video of them going through like it's a small world. <laughs> so it, it's just it's very interesting. Um, so I mean, you have like this uh, this digital instant communication, but you also have like now, especially San Francisco. I like to call San Francisco like what the future could be. Um, and I'm from San Francisco. I just flew up here for or down here, I guess, down here for this. Um, and so you have um, like like instant delivery of everything that you can possibly imagine. So for example, like Amazon Prime, like can I get a show of hands who has Amazon Prime? So it's like pretty good, right? That was revolutionary. So when it came out, you're like, wow, I can get anything on the internet delivered in two days. Now that is way too slow, you know? <laughs> Man, I cannot wait two days. And like every once in a while I go to like a retailer and they're like, this is like two weeks from now. And I'm like, two weeks? Two weeks I'll like have completely forgotten I bought this. You know, I, it's like it's like Christmas all over again. You're like, wow, what's here? What did, what did I get? Um, you know, but now there's like Google Shopping Express where I wake up in the morning and I go, hey, I'm out of paper towels. And I get on my phone and I order paper towels. And four hours later, some dude shows up at my house with like paper towels. And I'm like, thanks, dude. And, uh, you know, I go on my merry way and now I have paper towels. And this is how I get everything delivered. I don't even know what the inside of a store looks like anymore. <laughs> right? And, and you've got like Postmates, which they, um, for places that don't deliver, they'll send a dude to go there and go pick it up for you and you pay them some amount of money. So you, you can be like, you know, there's this boutique shop that I really like, like this stuff. Can I go get that? Actually, I think they're specifically for restaurants. But like, there's this restaurant that I really like. And the guy will go there and get it for you and bring it to wherever you are. So you have this really uninterrupted life in the sense of you can kind of do whatever you want and all this stuff is kind of taken uh, care for you. Now, does the dude yes. actually get it himself, or does he have an app where he gets somebody else? <laughs> 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 that is the future. I thought, I thought that's next. But, yeah, time. right, right. But what I want to see, and it's probably a study already being done, is what is the generation that is truly a digital native who lives seamlessly on and offline every moment of the day, doing way more than six apps. They're going from their computer, they're texting, they're watching TV, they're, they're, they're updating their profiles, whatever they're doing. Like, what 40 years from now, for doing that for 40 years, are they going to be like? Well, we because won't, yeah. we won't it's got to have an impact. We won't talk to we each won't other. Talk, you know, right. if, if you've got teenagers in your house, really it's, a, it's impossible to talk to your kids. Just text now. them. They'll get it. Because here's, <laughs> here's what it is. It's this. Nice There's a stuff. lot of multitasking that's going on. Well, so right. I think technology makes everything more efficient, which is amazing. But at the same time, then you have way too many things going on at the same time that you're managing. So you might be sitting here in a meeting, but really you're like like chatting and like trying to figure out what your plans are for the weekend, and then you're like looking up something for your next meeting. So there's like this way that you kind of it's kind of like you see everything. You're like here, but you see everything around you. At the same time. I'll just point out it's like China. Both based on my teenage children and <laughs> actual scholarly study, people are not quite as good at managing the multiple screen sessions as they think they are, and sometimes exams <laughs> point that out as well. So. Mm -hmm. Um, no, I, I feel bad in my lecture sometimes when I'm talking to students on the laptop and I feel like I'm competing against the entire stockpile of human culture uh, with my little lecture and it's sometimes a little difficult, but oh well. Um, well, what Aww. makes you... I know. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, they're listening. That, that's they're why just, I invited Julia's group. They're listening, they're doing other things. Okay, that's right. They're ordering food from the Great. Right. It means <laughs> great. It's great. And they're, and they're They'll come deliver it. Food. You just heat it up. I, I guess Don't I should have a If you're going to order food from the dude, order one for <laughs> one in the class. So. Uh, OK, so what is the change you see coming down the pike that you're optimistic about? What is, what is a hopeful change in technology or your field that you see? Coming? Hopeful change. So I think technology, technology is so interesting because, I mean, literally, if you blink, it, you're, you're just outdated. You're obsolete. Like, I wake up every morning and I read tech news because there's always something coming down the pipe. Um, I think the most interesting part is actually the platforms. Um, so when I was at Facebook, I worked on the platform team. And so the way I describe uh, platform is that's any sort of social integration that's on Facebook that is not developed by Facebook. So that's your, your games on Facebook. Facebook, any other applications. So anything that is not developed by Facebook, or that's any time that you, inter or that you um, interact with uh, Facebook that's across the web. So you could go to CNN, and you could like log into Facebook, right? Or you could go and uh, like push the like button or something like that. So any sort of so social integration like that. Um, and that the platform team revolutionized Facebook as a company. Like before when it was just a site, like we call it like in Chrome, it, it was like not that interesting. It was, it was, 
you know, a destination site that people went to sometimes. But now it's everywhere, right? You bring your friends with you everywhere. Everything is personalized. And so every time a new platform comes up, that's a real amazing opportunity. So we saw it with, you know, um, Apple and the iPhone, right? Like, you have applications that you can do everything. I think right before this, we're, you were telling me about an application where it was for blind people. You can take a photo of someone, and the application will describe what that photo um, looks like. So they'll be like, this is a girl with a green dress. And it's amazing. It's life-changing. totally stole my story. If I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> hey, I, I thought I was the person about, about digital innovation. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to have to pay someone 10 bucks to bring me an answer now. Yeah. My bad. Um, so yeah, you just get uh, these really uh, amazing platforms. And so every time there's a new platform, it is like the wild, wild west. And no one really knows how to use it. You're like, we have this new technology. And so I mentioned Google Glass earlier. That's a new platform. It's going to be crazy interesting to see how people use it. Because now you have this wearable technology all the time that has you know, photos and videos. And you can do other things. So, so how are developers going to use that? Um, you know, Facebook recently bought um, Oculus Rift which is a virtual reality platform. Um, I haven't used it myself, but it's, you know, I mean, can you imagine like another world, right? And so how are people going to build applications on top of that? And so I think anytime there's a, a new platform, and I, like, I think those are two that are very, very interesting, but I couldn't tell you which other ones will be developed in the future. That's where there's like the real opportunity for real change. I want to follow with Andrew yes. since you took his story. Sorry, and I'm so sorry. Right, I got not really, not oh, really. Yeah, I'm ready. Okay. Um, <laughs> I think it's you know kind of what we've already touched on the the the, the buzz about phrase now in my business is, is TV everywhere, mm -hmm. um, which means you'll be able to watch um, 13 episodes if that's a full season of your favorite show day and date when it's released on any device anywhere in the world at any time um, immediately and uh, and that's great and that's going to generate a lot of viewership and it's going to get people invested in shows immediately and it's going to um, eliminate some of the risk of people kind of um, eroding away from shows um, because you know their uh, attention and time is being competed for um, and uh, and there's a lot of value to that and at the same time um, you know uh, patience is is becoming a, a scarce virtue and um, in, I mean does anybody know what the biggest show on television is no I bet you he knows football. Sunday night football is the biggest show on television. <laughs> and and it's great to watch people, you know, tackle each other, and and, and football is a thrilling sport. But there is also um, huge value in make, making people wait a week for something, and only being able to watch it live, and not knowing the outcome until it's actually over. So I think it's this double-edged sword that's going to continue to benefit people on both sides of the spectrum, uh, both sides of the spectrum. But it's 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 you know it's a huge huge advantage to be able to be involved with live event programming that all the technology in the world isn't going to change. And, and what that is is just a form of reality television. Yeah. Like you said, the unscripted event, live television, I don't think that will, will ever be replaced. What I see coming down the pipe is more interactive components to television. Um, the fans will get involved now. You will now be able to very soon pull up the replay that you want to see, not the replay that the network wants you to see. Uh, you will be able to, once the NFL figures out how to monetize this, you'll be able to <laughs> say, hey, I want this play called. And, and they will have a drawing, and they'll pick out of 100,000 entries, they'll pick five plays, and they'll pick one of those plays. So the, the viewer, the fan, whatever you want to call it, will be more involved in the process itself. And, and I just going back to what we were talking about a few minutes ago, and this is more of a social question, there, there is more of a, of a of this and more remote access and everything is new media and the email and we talk to each other without seeing each other and really knowing each other. And have you noticed how hard it is sometimes to talk to a person uh, face to face? It's easier to talk to them. You, you, you know, people, I call them email heroes. Boy, they say all kind of things on the email. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but then when you get in front of them, it's like, are you the same person I was talking to? <laughs> So I just, just looking forward, I wonder socially. Hey, I'm uh, in technology. I understand. Yeah, right, right. I just wonder if, you know, are we getting further and further apart from each other when all of this technology is supposed to bring us together? I wonder if there'll be some implosion or some kickback at some point where just people will say too much. And, you know, when we were asked the question, what is it going to look like in 40 years? Well, besides our jokes that we probably won't be alive well, in 40 years here. to be here, you know, we, we talk about today is it's a bit of the Jetsons. You know, when I was a kid, you watched the Jetsons, and we've somewhat, besides the little flying ships, we've gotten there. Um, 
And I think what's scary is when you look at things like Google Glass and other products that are definitely the wearables of the, the, the today, what is the future? Is it embedded? You know, your phone's ringing, hello, you know, you, you're getting a, you know, a message, you're getting your communications in any channel, any format you want, it's, it's, it's on you, it's in you. Uh, you know, it's a, scary, it's a scary thing, but we talk about that all the time, you know, because technology has become so pervasive. What's the next step? In you? To be well, I think optimistic what's optimistic section. Oh, right. <laughs> Just to... well, what I think is really Some interesting people might is actually we're being really technically amazing. optimistic. <laughs> what I think is really interesting is actually how identity has changed on the internet. So if you think about like the internet, like a very long time ago, it was this anonymous beast, right? You had like, you're like, I am fire girl one three five six seven, and then you just like lied about your na your name and your age and location, right? You're and not. and then it kind of went through this cycle where you know Facebook was actually very prevalent in pushing this. Where we're like, no, like Facebook's about your real identity, and we'd shut down people if they weren't um, putting their real identity up. So if they you know decided to go by even some nickname, a lot of times we're like, nope, can't do it. So we like really push people to have their real identities there. So I mean that added an enormous amount of value in many ways because now you can authenticate um, across the web with your real identity and Facebook has done a really good job making sure that that is actually who you are. But now you're seeing things like, you know, uh, like people are kind of rebelling the other way. So now you've got like Snapchat coming up where you take a photo and it explodes as soon as you like take your finger off of um, the photo, and you have like things like Secret and Whisper, which are um, kind of like anonymous. I call it like anonymous TMZ for yeah. regular people. Is kind of the best way to describe it. It's just in other words, people just like put up um, all sorts of random stuff, like very anonymously. And even um, even platforms like Quora. Uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with that, where it's a uh, Hmm, question and answer, like really great question and answers. If you haven't checked that out, I would definitely check that out. But they have the ability to write things anonymously too because they do a lot of uh, questions around, you know, like what does it feel to murder someone? And the, the person who's murdering it is definitely not like, yay, please send me to jail. Um, but you get some really interesting insights from that as well. Um, so it kind of identity, or like kind of this, this idea of identity has just kind of gone full circle from the internet being just anonymous to begin with, kind of coming to who you actually are and actually trying to just go back the other way. Well, I wanted to wrap up with the final question, which is based on what you've seen and also what we've been talking about tonight, what advice would you give to comp study students or you know, future students to help prepare for this future in your field? Can I start? You can. I'm looking All at right. you. All right. I'm starting. Right. I can do Judy by default. <laughs> um, I mean, for comp study students, I would say you are the future. Uh, you have unlimited opportunity to make whatever impact you want. Uh, if you find a problem that you think is a problem for more than yourself, then go solve it. Solve it any way you want. I'm an entrepreneur myself. I work in a travel technology startup, and I'm solving a problem that I have seen. Um, so if you're curious, you can sign up for Enchanted Labs. Is our, we haven't uh, launched yet. But I mean, it's really like the onus is really on you. Um, to do whatever you want. Um, I would say, you know, stay up to date, again, with the newest platforms and uh, the newest uh, devices, I think, is really helpful, too, because I think that'll open a lot of doors. But mm -hmm. it's, it's really, it's, you know, like, you can do anything. That's my advice. Oh, that's hopeful. <laughs> um, I'll be hopeful. I'd say two things. One is just kind of riffing off of what Julia said. I totally agree. I, I think, you know, we sit around and, and speculate and prognosticate a lot about what the future is going to bring. Um, and I think that encourages people to kind of um, guess and chase the trend. And I think that it's better to go in one of two directions, which is to either um, decide what the future is and define it yourself proactively, um, or to do something that um, is uh, is viable independent of where the technology goes. So storytelling. I mean, if you want to be a writer of content, it's always going to matter. Storytelling is always going to be about those fundamentals that I mentioned earlier. So th there's kind of like, it's, it's um, recession proof, as, as you might say, to technology. Um, and uh, the other thing I'd say is uh, be original. Um, you know, one of the, the, the things that's happened to the TV business that's not as great, despite it being in, a, in, a, in another golden age, is that it, it's kind of what I call the, the franchisization of TV. And I probably shouldn't make up words in a comp studies gathering. But um, <laughs> it, it's, it's what you're seeing with, with sequels and remakes um, for years now in movies is starting to happen in, in TV. And I find when I read about one of, the, one of these announcements of a show they're, they're remaking or bringing back, I always have one of two reactions. One is like, why would you remake The Odd Couple? Like, you got it perfectly right the first time. I don't understand. Or it's like, and the show shall remain nameless, but why would you remake something that was crap the first time around? <laughs> um, 
and and some of some of these shows find traction, whether it's because of nostalgia or whether it's because of you know the networks just using millions of, of marketing dollars to, to ram the show down your throat. Um, but but the shows that that people are talking about, the shows that are winning Emmys, the shows that you know kind of bring people to the to the TV in the first place are the shows that you've never seen before. It is you know um, it is Walking Dead, it is Homeland, it is Breaking Bad, um, it is The Wire. So. Uh, I think it's important to break new ground. Oh, a point of House of Cards was a remake. So. It was an adaptation of a okay. British show, so it was new to the American audience. You Careful, Tim, who you're arguing with. Like, yeah. <laughs> like, and, I, and we won't even talk about Battlestar Galactica, but I'm just putting that down. Oh. So. <laughs> so. Anyway, moving forward, Ron? Yeah. I, I think listen to your professors. Listen. Okay. Wow. And I know that seems like, okay, whatever, but but... I can remember Dr. Rosenthal saying, communication law is going to be big one day. I don't even think we knew what communication really was, but now I look at what it's become and it is huge in all, in all facets. My wife is, is an agent and she works in that business, so that, that's big. And patience. I think everyone, the, the, the technology wants us to get, like you said, Julia, get everything now. Get it now, send it now, make it happen right now. I think in haste you miss a lot of things. And there's going to be so many things out there, there's going to be enough to go around, believe me. It's like Marty Gregory told me when I went into the office for the third time because I didn't get into the communications major until late. She said, you just be patient and keep applying. And I did. So I, I, I would say those, those things right there will be important. And what do you think, Judy? Yeah. <laughs> Well, because it's Thursday and we spent so much time talking about technology and on most social media sites for brands, there's a thing called Throwback Thursday. So I'm going to go to a flash to the past for a bit and say that there is nothing old-fashioned at all about um, the art of great storytelling no matter what you're in, whether it's TV, whether it's the news, whether it's public relations, whether it's marketing, uh, any type of communications whatsoever because if you don't have a story that people want to hear, they don't really want to listen. Um, and I think that there is nothing, uh, again, lost in excellent oral communication. It's an excellent written communication. And with all the technology we've talked about, I have hired thousands of people. And I can honestly say I've hired probably five really great writers um, and probably, you know, a couple dozen really great oral communicators. And those are skills that will prevail forever. Um, and I think two things we learn in school that will never go away uh, as a communicator is truly understand your audience. And the audience is getting splintered and splintered and splintered. And, you know, when I started, it was like, we're marketing to moms or we're communicating to, you know, school teachers or whatever it was. But now it's like, what kind of moms? Yoga moms, stay home moms, executive moms, gay moms? God knows, there's 90,000 kinds of moms. Um, and they're all awesome moms, so you got to learn how to talk to them in a way that works for them. Um, and then it goes back to a true tenet again, what's your message? You know, you got to be consistent with your audience and resonate. You got to have a consistent message that makes sense across all the ways you want to communicate, whether it's a, you know, um, a story you're telling on TV, a film, or a marketing a brand. So those are some basics that don't go away. The nuance that I'll add that's new, though, is in the world in which I was educated, um, it was an era of generalism. You, you got into a communications field and you did a whole lot of everything. And that really is not possible to be good at everything anymore. And the beauty in that, though, is there are a lot of really unique jobs, whether it's the visual arts um, for um, communications or whether it's the written word or it's you know, the digital aspect. I mean, you can pick what you really love and you're good at and be a specialist and go all the way up to the senior ranks of an EVP in that specialism as opposed to before, if you didn't do it all, you couldn't get ahead. So pick your passion, because work shouldn't be work, it should be love. Okay, well, speaking of love, I love this panel. Thank you guys <laughs> very much. And can I just if you guys can I say one more thing? Oh, no. I just, <laughs> no, I promise it'll be family friendly. I just want to tell you how starstruck I am that Tyus Edney is in the, in the uh, audience. Yeah, back I am as well. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, on that note, if everyone would like to go out to the lobby again for reception, uh, I'd love to see you all there. Okay. Thank you again. Yeah. Thank you. Oh. Nice job, well, we survived the channel. <laughs>